Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me at this month's Mission Momentum. Most of you know me. I am Chris Fuller, the Chief Sponsorship and Mission Integration Officer. And each month I host uh, one of these Mission Momentums to further our ongoing reflection on our mission as a Catholic Mercy uh, Institution of Higher Learning. Uh, and as uh, uh, last month, I started a, a new series, which I will do periodically, which I'm calling Get to Know the Community, to help our community at St. Joseph's get to know the community around us better. And tying that in with Black History Month, I thought it would be an opportune time to learn a little bit more about African-American history in our area. And in particular, the Abyssinian Meeting House, uh, which I first discovered when I moved here two years ago or three years ago, just walking in the neighborhood. I live here in Portland walked by it and saw the sign and had uh, no idea. So I thought it'd be helpful to have someone uh, with the Abyssinian Meeting House to come join us today to talk about the house, its history, and the current restoration efforts there. So the person who's joining us today is Pam, 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 sorry, Pam, Pam Cummings, who is Director mm -hmm. of Education and the President of the Board of Directors there. So, Pam, welcome. Thank you for joining us here at St. Joseph's. Hi, and, and thank you for uh, inviting me to speak with you and giving me an hour of your day. Um, everybody's days are busy, so thank you very much for including me in this conversation. Great. So what if, if, why don't you tell us um, just a little bit about yourself first uh, sure. and how you came to be associated with the Abyssinian uh, Mini House, and then we'll talk a little bit about the house itself. Okay. Um, again, my name is Pam Cummings. I am the president uh, for the Committee to Restore the Abyssinian Meeting House, um, as well as a Director of Education and Educational Programs. Um, I became a part of uh, this project quite organically. Uh, my sister is the founder of the committee. Um, my father was the president. Um, I find myself as the president because one day he just was tired and at a board meeting he said, I'm done. And I was the vice president, and so you know how that goes. <laughs> when, uh, when one steps down, the next one in line steps up. Um, I really, I had no idea of what I was doing. Um, I knew some of it because I'd been around it for so long with my sister and my father and my mother and hearing about all the conversations about the Abyssinian, and I, I really did not want to um, be a part of it. But um, I'm so grateful today, and, and I took on the task as the Facebook uh, manager back then. And as I began to do that, I developed a real passion and a real love um, for this project, for this history. I'm um, watching how lives were impacted, how children of colors, uh, of color lives had been impacted uh, when they got to come to the Abyssinian Meeting House. Uh, they finally had a story to hear and a story to tell. Um, and so uh, I, I delved in and I just I, I just fell in love with the project and have not stopped since. So every right. chance that I get uh, to talk about it, to explain it, to explain history that's been completely left out of textbooks. Um, and, and I don't know how that happens because I tell everybody um, this great history that starts out as, as the history of the city of Portland um, soon became the state of Maine history, which was a part of U.S. history, which fits into the scope of world history as well. So I don't know how these important facts get left out of history and that we explain it as history, um, but we're here to correct that, um, to make a difference. And it would have it that as time goes on, more and more ears are interested in hearing this story. Um, the issue and uh, at hand, um, has, has, we, we have a lot more people that are now more interested in hearing this history, and they don't just see it as Black history, which it is, but it becomes a part, more of a part of our history, um, each and every one of us. And I often invite you to find your history and our history, uh, because it's all there. We're all, we're, we're all together in this ship, so that's it. That's good. And, and you're right. It has quite a rich history once you, you look into it. Um, first, it's almost 200 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I founded in 1828, so we're just shy of its 200th uh, birthday. Yeah. Uh, and it began as a house of worship, correct? That's exactly right. 
And, and how, um, go ahead, go sorry. Ahead. So absolutely, it, it began as a house of worship. So uh, the backstory to that I think is, is, is more important than it, it, what it became. The reason that it became what it became because people don't um, associate uh, racism with the state of Maine or slaves with the state of Maine. And I grew up in Portland, Maine and lived here for the first 18 years of my life uh, before I went away to college. And I had never heard of this building, never heard of this history, um, didn't know it existed. And, and like many people, I thought, oh, uh, we're, we're in Maine, you know, we're tucked away and, and we weren't a part of this. When in fact, um, the, the mere fact that this building was erected would let you know that racism was alive and well then. But unless you know the story and unless you know the history, you don't understand what a big part it was. Um, and there were uh, five black men. Uh, they were free. They were free African-American men who in 1828, um, they were tired of being kept out of um, the churches, the local church here in Portland, which was the, fir the first congregational church of Portland where they were members. And when they went to church there, they were not allowed to worship um, in the main sanctuary. They were relegated to the balcony and to the corners of the building. And, and this just didn't include um, the black people that lived here, but when you had visitors that came in, um, sailors or, or men that were mariners worked on the, the shores, when they came, um, they too were relegated. And at about that time in 1828, um, black people were beginning to build their own houses of worship. And these five black men spoke up. Um, they petitioned uh, the, the church and they said, you know, this isn't right. We don't like the way we're being treated. Uh, it isn't fair. We would like to have our own church. Uh, they were granted the right, and the um, Abyssinian Religious Society was then formed. And then in 1832, I believe, it became the Abyssinian Meeting House, or I'm sorry, the Abyssinian Church. <laughs> and since we have changed the name to the Abyssinian Meeting House. It was a, a humble house of worship, um, and there it was the, the central hub where people came. Uh, they worshipped there. The black community came. They worshipped there. They um, had speakers there, Frederick Doug Douglass, um, William Lloyd Harrison. They gave uh, impressional speeches there. Um, and while the members of the congregation helped those on the Underground Railroad find their way uh, to Canada and sometimes from Canada to England, which meant freedom. Um, and so um, I, I guess that, that's where I kind of start to come in here um, and, and ask first the question that I, I should always ask and not assume is that everybody knows that this is an Underground Railroad and that the train is nowhere to be found on the Underground Railroad. Is this correct? <laughs> okay. You laugh, but, uh, you know, sometimes um, the children come in, or, you know, pre-COVID, they would come into the building, and um, they just, they, you know, some kids were scratching their heads because they just couldn't understand. This didn't look anything like the train station they were expecting. They were like, well, where's the train? And I was like, oh, gosh, guys, it's not the Underground Railroad. But that's not just left to children's foolishness. I've had some adults come in and who have asked, too, where is the train uh, for the Underground Railroad? So I love when I get that question because I love to be able to correct the misinformation or their perception of what they thought that the Underground Railroad was. So we're free to go on to let you know that the Underground Railroad is more about a movement. It was one of the most multi multicultural collaborative events and in, in protest in U.S. history as ordinary uh, men and women of many races and religions uh, worked together, pulled together for common goal in a case, and in this case was um, social justice. And oftentimes people think that that the civil rights movement began in 1960 when in fact this Abyssinian meeting house was 
the first Civil Rights Act here because it was these people that were fighting for their right to be treated equally um, and to correct the evils and the injustices of slavery. The Abyssinian Meeting House is um, the third oldest um, standing African-American meeting house in the United States. And it was built to serve Portland's established community of free black residents. And I don't know if you're all are familiar with the Great Fire of Portland, which occurred in 1866, um, which in the city of Portland, it was a fire where most of the city, there were only a few buildings that survived in that area, um, that survived that fire of Greater Portland. And the Abyssinian Meeting House was one of them. Um, that was saved when one of the members there, um, he was a fireman and had the wherewithal to soak blankets, wet blankets, keep blanket, blankets wet all night long, and to um, put it on, excuse me, the roof of the building. Um, hence, when the embers fell or came flying onto the building, they didn't stand a chance because these blankets were soaking wet. And that in itself, um, and by the grace of God and that, that one thing that he did saved that building from burning. I mean, there are pictures that, that show, if you ever get a chance to go and look at it, what the city looked like. And so for us to, um, that building to have been saved is just incredibly, um, incredibly humbling because we have a job, we must have a job to do and work to do to keep this history alive. Um, and, and, and over the course of the 19th century, um, the Abyssinian church at that time had housed a segregated Portland public school for black children. Um, the, the, the black children were, it was thought would, would, never, um, would never learn. They were children who couldn't learn. They were children who were unruly, children who had no future. Uh, but there was one of the, the ministers that came here, um, and his name was Amos Freeman. He was the second pastor that served, was the principal of the black school, and he believed in education. So he took on the responsibility of educating those students. Um, and it served as, as the Portland Public School for all of those years until the taxpayers in Portland, Maine, decided that they weren't paying taxes anymore. And, and it wasn't for anything more than those children can all learn together. Hmm, that was an interesting concept. He was interested, they were interested in segregating the schools, which they didn't call it that. They just weren't paying the taxes anymore for these children to go to school. And um, the, the desegregation went so well, the putting the children into the Portland public schools went so well that it became a model um, for the rest of the country when they had to start to do the same thing. Um, and the, all children would go to school together and the, the segregation and desegregation ending of and beginning of. So um, the P Portland Public School was great. And, and, I, and, and I think though, um, what happens here is you have a common thread. And even today, um, it, it's, it's quite amazing because you know, if you don't know this, we've been restoring this building for almost 25 years, um, 28 years. And it isn't because we can't do it. Up until a few years ago, it was a lack of money. And so the common thread becomes, um, you know, people, it, it all pretty much started back then with the Underground Railroad, for example. I, I had told you that it was um, one of the most multicultural collaborative events, but also, what that Underground Railroad did was it let people know that Black people weren't stupid because that was a highly successful organized machine. Um, and it let people know that, wow, these people are intelligent. Wow, they can get it done. Wow, they're able to think on their own. They, 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 they didn't need our help. And the school, it was much the same way. The children that were in the school, they thought, wow, these kids can learn. Wow, these kids can be well-behaved because the thought wasn't that. And it's, it's quite funny because 
we often heard, not recent, but in the past few years, of the chatter and the noise in the backdrop of people saying, because it's taken us so long, these people don't know what they're doing. They can't do this on their own. They need our help. They need our money. And we do need your money and we do need your help. But that's not why it didn't get done. It didn't get done because we weren't able. It's a highly political, political building um, project. Um, so, so that was really the reason because people didn't understand that there was a need for this history to be uncovered. Um, we had a group of people that came through on a bus and this is when we didn't have regular hours or we didn't have people come in. And one of the neighbors said, you know, why are you people, why are you people wasting your time? Nobody cares about that building. Nobody cares about the history in that building. We don't need it. But I, but I dare tell you that um, it's very much needed. And thank God everybody understands today that it's needed because everybody wants to learn now how we can all work together as, as a community, as a country, as a world, how we can all work. And, we, and we're finding that in order to understand, we need to know beginnings. We need to know histories. How did you get here? You know, how did this happen? How did that happen? It becomes really important. Um, and so I, I just love being able to be a part of it. Um, not only did the, the Abyssinian um, house in the public school, it also hosted lectures. And as I told you, uh, William Lloyd Garrison was there. Um, and um, Franklin Douglas was there um, as well. Um, so it, it's, it's a very rich history. The Anti-Slavery Society of Maine um, was started there. Um, religious services instructions were held in a predominantly black um, congregation. But for the first time, they had a building that was their own. They found their voice in this building. And, and I, I don't know if you know much about it, but I know sometimes people that are marginalized and um, ostracized, that when they have a place that they feel that they're not invisible, that they are being heard, it's empowering. And so it empowered them to go on and, and fight for other things uh, that really mattered. They were a they were globally minded group of people that led at the Abyssinian Meeting House because they then went on to become a very big part of the Underground Railroad here in Maine. And because of the Abyssinians' um, location near the shipping docks, it's an important link to the Underground Railroad where slaves could seek haven traveling towards Canada. And so a lot of the members of the Abyssinian church that sponsored a lot of the work that was done for um, the runaway slaves on the underground, the underground railroad. Um, so they would, they would find themselves, <clears throat> they would come to the dock via ships or train, but most likely ships, because at that time that was a profession that black men were, um, allowed to be a part of. They became successful heads of households doing that. Um, and they had money that they were able to contribute to the Abyssinian church as well as the underground movement. Um, through their the ministers that came, they were connected um, through the U.S. Uh, by, uh, you know, the, these, these were college educated men and uh, they would just have a circuit you know, one from Philadelphia would then move to New York, to, New to Connecticut, to Massachusetts, to Maine. And so they all knew each other very well and what was going on in and around the country. And they were able to connect. And um, that's how uh, William Lloyd Garrison, he came to speak at the uh, Quakers Church, which is located in, in the park in Portland. Um, and that then it was the building in the church. He came and had an incredible speech and the black people then invited him back for the next night at the Ab Abyssinian meeting house. And he was able to tell Reuben Ruby, who's a hack driver about the movement in Massachusetts 
and they were able to bring it to Maine and collaborate and work together. Um, and, and, it's, and it's quite important that I let you know that it wasn't just um, the black population that was a part of this movement. They couldn't have done it. They couldn't have done it without each other, first of all, but more importantly, um, there were a lot of Quakers, a lot of the Quake, the white people that were involved were Quakers. Um, and th it was quite beneficial uh, because they had to, it was in their homes. And a, a lot of people, people often think, well, wouldn't they have hid them, the runaway slaves in the Abyssinian, when in fact that's not true because they had um, bounty hunters. They had people that were signed finding them so that they could return them back to the South. Um, and the people that helped risk their lives, the lives of their family, um, the members of their family, because had they been found, uh, the runaway slaves had been found, you're, you could be killed, your family members could be killed. Um, and there's a story uh, of a family uh, that, that had runaway slaves in there that housed, it was a safe house, uh, they they helped the runaway slaves, and and the um, the they had somebody one of the hunt, uh, bounty hunters. He came to the door and he knocked, and they answered the door. They had no problem answering their door. Well, they had two two kegs of uh, gunpowder underneath their porch, and they let it be known that if they moved any closer in that house, they said no, they weren't there. And if they came to inspect it, if they moved any closer. She was going to drop a candle on her porch, and they'd all go up. So um, it was, it was, it was people like that, um, white people that helped the black people in this movement that could not have done it um, without the help of these people. They were diehards. They they were determined that they were going to get rid of the evils, the the evils of slavery. And, and I'm talking kind of fast here. I'm trying to get it all in. So I'll, I'll take a breath here and, and ask uh, if anybody has any questions just yet or if I can keep moving. If one I have, you mentioned um, you mentioned Reverend uh, Freeman. Yeah. And, you know, we tend to think today um, we want our religion to be separate from our politics. We want religion mm -hmm. to be private and politics to be public. Uh, but Reverend Freeman was didn't just it, it, as far as what I was able to find in some of my research. He wasn't just a promoter of the railroad. He was an agent of the railroad. Is that correct? Yes, yes, he was. Yes, he was. And and, and actually, um, the thing about him is that, that he was a man who was educated, and he really was educating. He wanted all black people educated because he wanted them educated and returned back to Africa, himself included. Um, he didn't you know, not realizing that we were all going to have to stay here for as long as we did or have or are. Um, his goal at first was just to educate the, the black people uh, and then let them go. And absolutely, he was a part. Everybody that was um, a part of the Abyssinian church, they were also very active in the moving of those slaves and the housing of those slaves. And so and we, when you go on the uh, Freedom Trail, um, you'll find that there's a uh, barber shop there, um, and there is a uh, clothing store. It's a clothing store that was there, and a bookstore, and they're integral parts of that underground railroad. Because you know we take for granted that um, these people just came and they you know they, they'd hide out someplace, but and, and, but they they couldn't um, because the Fugitive Slave Act was enforced, which says that. Um, if you escape and we find you, we can return you back to the cell. And they got paid a handsome amount of money for catching and returning them. And so that was their job to find these runaway slaves. And they would sit down there and wait for them to come in. Um, and so you had to carefully, you know, meet them. And you have to remember that the people that worked on the boats, uh, the, the, the boats back then, the black people had access to the schedule. They had access to the boat. It was their job and they were trusted. So it, it was them smuggling in the um, black people 
and the runaway slave. They would smuggle them and hide them. And then when they got here, one of the members of the Abyssinian meeting house, um, Reuben Ruby, who had his hack stand, and then there was another man, and they would meet them um, at the boat and whisk them away to um, the barbershop because it became very important for them to change um, their physical appearance because the bounty hunters had to know who it was that they were looking for. So the first thing they did was, you know, change their appearance. If they didn't have a beard, maybe give them a beard. If they didn't have a mustache, give them one. If they did, take it away. You know, their hair, the way that it might have been, put a wig on them, change their appearance. And then from there, whisk them off to the secondhand clothing store or the clo used clothing store, which it is there that they had been given clothes to survive the cold winters because it was best to travel for these slaves in the winter, believe it or not, because daylight hours were way shorter than they would be in the summer. So they had more time to stay under the cover of darkness. But then they were given these clothes. And sometimes in the books from the secondhand, um, the bookstore and the clothing store, uh, messages were put inside of them. There was a gentleman who was from, uh, he was a freed slave from uh, North Carolina. South Carolina. And he lived in um i'm sorry i just got a message that distracted me he um he moved to massachusetts and when he was in massachusetts he uh, did a pamphlet that told about the evils of slavery and what was being done about them around the country um and they would often they would uh, sew that inside of coats or jackets or something that the slaves would get and they could read and then they would know what was going on and it finally got wind of it in the South, and then they made it so that the Black people there then definitely could not read or write it again. Um, they were very, very adamant about that. Um, and these are, all, these are all acts that all went on, the helping of the ending of slavery, the helping of the um, fugitive slaves being transported from the South to the North, um, the feeding of them, the clothing of them, the housing of the, the, the runaway slaves, because their goal is to get to Canada. And the Abyssinian meeting house, this, this, the, the Abyssinian meeting house or the Abyssinian church back then was a, a, a noted spot here in Maine. And that this Maine was the last spot before you got to Canada. And the people at, the, at this Abyssinian meeting house were really, really active and instrumental in helping these fugitive slaves escape towards their freedom. Um, so I hope I answered that question um, of yours as I, as I continue to move on. Um, and so um, the Abyssinian, uh, the, the members there were also part of the, um, the Benevolent Society for Women. Um, it was there and through William Lloyd Garrison that they were able to, uh, that a lot of women uh, were able to find their voice. Um, so, again, another very good thing that, that these people had done. Um, they had um, the, the uh, person who gave the money, which was Reuben Ruby. And if you look on um, the Underground Railroad uh, Freedom Trail, You'll see that he owned his own hack stand. He was an astute businessman, an astute businessman. And he bought that, that whole street for $200, um, which, doesn't, which sounds today like, well, that's not very much. But back then, that was a lot. And then he divided each plot of land for $200. And he gave the land to the Abyssinian so that these men could build their house of worship and be allowed to come in and worship freely. Um, and also the Abyssinian meeting house, it really is, um, a symbol, if you will, I, I would like to think, um, and it isn't necessarily that I, that I think that, um, but it really is, um, it, it really stands for, um, what happens, number one, when, as I said before, people are marginalized. 
and ostracized and you find a place that you can find your voice and then you have others who work with you. And we, we could all stand to learn a lot from lessons of the Abyssinian Meeting House or the Abyssinian Church, as well as the Underground Railroad. Um, you know, it, the, 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 the timeless lessons that are used um, to, to make all of that successful uh, could be used today with a lot of the problems uh, that we do have. Uh, and, and I do have uh, one, one, uh, one fact, one, one nice fact. I don't know if any of you know of um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, a book that was written by Harry Beecher Stowe. Um, and it was performed as a play uh, at the Abyssinian Church back then because many of the characters as defined by Harry Beecher Stowe in the book Uncle Tom's Cabin were members that were associated um, with the Abyssinian Church. Well, I don't know, a lot of people don't know that, but um, it is in fact um, true. And um, I just, I can't, I can't reiterate anymore how important that this building, the history in this building, how important it is that everybody understands that, that there was racism, that there was slavery, and that this building itself and the people in that building um, worked to be a part of dismantling slavery. Um, they were a very active part in it, and and we have there's a there's a lot to be proud of in that. And it's really important that this that this history that this movement continued to move on. And, and as I said, I am the director of education, and I do work with the children. And I cannot tell you um, the sense of pride that some of these younger black children um, have when, you know, you can only imagine that they have been going to the Victoria Mansion or the main historic society or the, um, the tower uh, Portland Landmarks has. Um, they go to all of these sites and not any of them have been designated towards for them about their history. And when they finally get a chance for their classmates, for their peers to come in and to see this building and to be proud of what their ancestors did um, for them, the blood, sweat, and tears that went into that building for them um, so that, that they could be who they are today and have the opportunities that they have today. Um, it just is incredible to watch when they leave how much lighter they are, how much happier they are. You know, as kids would be, they, they're dancing and jumping around and, and you know, finding, finding me. And, and I always get these hugs. And, and, and I love when I get a child of, that's, that's white that comes to me and says, how can I help? What can I do? Um, that always touches my heart because that means that there's hope. You know, there's hope and, and as you know, it, it isn't about it just being um, this black history in this little teeny house in Portland, Maine. Um, it's, it's, it's our history. It's part of our fabric. It's, it's all of our history. And I, and I would encourage you to um, get involved with the Abyssinian in any, any way that you can. We do have, um, we are now restoring the building. Um, back to its natural and original use. Um, and that has been a long process. But as I said, we're, we're so fortunate um, with this whole Black Lives Matter movement, which was ironic because here you had on the steps of um, the city hall during the whole beginning of this you know, thousands of people chanting Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, when this building that, that they have been trying to restore that has a lot of black history in it and black lives did, black and white people together put their lives at risk to restore is, is just still sitting there. And at that time we were having such a hard time raising money, such a hard time restoring the building. And, and it was like, hello? If black lives really do matter, why aren't we restoring this building? People, 
let's take our efforts and not 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 forgetting but let's get this history out let's finish this building so that others can come and others can know because it means so much when you have tourists that come that building speaks so much volume to the city that we're in that they're visiting that some are coming to work in when you have this integral part of black history that stands dilapidated and it looks like nobody really cares about when we get it done let's now show that 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 all lives do matter of course but that black lives do matter that we want to know the history we want to know what happened with the slaves that came in here we want to know how many lives were endangered. We want to know about the blood, sweat, and tears that it took to put this building up and together. We want to know about how this building survived the Great Portland Fire and nobody else did. We want to know about the segregated public school for black children. We want to know what did everybody do to make Portland the city that it is today. And unless... We tell the story, you won't know the story. Unless you tell the story, we don't learn what we did or didn't do that we can correct to make the world a better place to live in. So I would encourage all of you to look, um, look up the Abyssinian Meeting House, to uh, tell the stories of the Abyssinian Meeting House, to make it known to your classes, because it's not just history. The Abyssinian can become, uh, become a... Um, math lesson, it becomes a science lesson, it becomes history, U.S., world, city, you know, local history. It becomes so much more than just stories. It, it is really, um, we, we don't realize how lucky we are in the city of Portland, in the state of Maine, to have this asset. And it's not just us, there are a lot of people that approach us on the national level that want to make this a part of the national landscape of African-American sites. So we're fortunate enough to have it, um, to learn from it and to keep it moving. And, um, you know, it's a lot of work and, and it's a lot of work that, that there is to do, but we like to say that we are still standing in faith and we still are, uh, we are still standing, but we are certainly not standing still. We are doing the work that is required of us to do um, with great diligence, with great passion and desire for everybody. This is a building, not our building. This is the building for the people here in the city of Portland and the state of Maine. And uh, from that, I yield my mic and I thank you. Well, thank you, Pam. I appreciate it. Uh, I think to your point about um, how important this building is, is to know also that for a period of time it kind of fell into disuse and was was, was used for many different kinds of things and eventually um came back into um the uh, possession of a group of people who wanted to restore it and we can only think of, given all the development in this part of the city there that there'd be a there could be a time when this building would not exist um so i think you're right we're very lucky to have we're lucky that people stepped in when there was the opportunity to do so, to purchase the building, to try to have it restored um, for historic purposes. Yeah, and 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 to, to that, I mean, they wanted to. Um, we've been offered to uh, because the 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 commission or the committee to restore the Abyssinian Meeting House, the city of Portland sold it to the committee for two hundred dollars because back then it really didn't matter. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of anything going on in that part of town. Um, so we wanted it for the historic purposes and again, to get our stories out, but they, they gave it to us. And, and then, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, they came back and said, oh, oh, okay. So, you know, it's taking you so long to do this. And, and we know, we know you need your, our help. Um, you can give us back the building um, and we'll let you lease it for a dollar a year. Well, this is why history becomes so important, because if you know your history, you will know that an awful lot of black people lost a lot of properties and churches back in during the Reconstruction period because they thought their saviors came to uh, give them th that they would take their buildings, but let them lease it back for a dollar a year. 
So here we are, fast forward to 2020, 2019, where they were, the same proposition was coming to us. Um, and if you don't know your history, we could have made that same mistake because there, oh, there were a lot, it was a, a hugely divisive to the board because there were a lot of people that just wanted to be done with this project. And then there were others who were saying, you know, wait, wait, we can't give this. Look, look at the blood, sweat, and tears. You can't give it back. And um, luckily, we finally got the message and we held on to it. And then they came back again. So um, we're not going anywhere, <laughs> needless to say. I, you, you mentioned that you mentioned the city of Portland. So I just did a quick little bit of research here. After George Floyd, the city yeah. council passed a resolution condemning racism. They mm -hmm. also passed a resolution to establish a racial equity steering committee. Yep. So I'm curious, has the city reached out to you at all in support after you mentioned that the, the amount of t attention that came to you after George Floyd and other um, um, other issues in the news afterwards? I'm just curious to know if the city itself has reached out in support to you at all. So um, so my father would, would, would like to, to tell you he's done the most work with the city of Portland. Um, he's grateful to John Jennings because John Jennings came under attack um, during the whole Black Lives Matter. And my father would like to tell you that um, John Jennings was the catalyst to a lot of um, the rebirth of the restoration. Um, um, you know, he was the beginning of people starting to understand that we needed to give money. That being said, we we do work with the city of Portland. Um, actually, I have a meeting with them this afternoon at three thirty. But um, they've they've. Uh, I would have liked to see them give a little more, and they have given. Um, but I'd like to. It was really disheartening that it was going to be given to us under the premise that we gave them back the deed to the building um, that that just I don't know how anybody could think that that would ever happen. But so that was disheartening. Now, I have posted in the chat here for people both a link to a PDF of the Portland Freedom Trail to map, uh, but also a link to your website so they can go to your website and there's the donate button in the upper right hand corner. So yeah. Can donate. Yeah. I just want to caution everybody. So the Abyssinian Meeting House is, is, is separate from the Freedom Trail. Though the, the Abyssinian Meeting House is on the Freedom Trail, yeah. um, and that becomes really important um, because there are a lot of people that are doing a lot of work um, in different communities that, that it kind of exclude the Abyssinian Meeting House, and everybody is left to think that you know we're all part of this big picture, um, and we are a part of the picture, but we aren't the picture. Um, so the Abyssinian Meeting House is separate though it sits on the Freedom Trail. Um, and, 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 and I just want to let everybody know that because oftentimes it's not known and, and different things end up going other places instead of where it's meant to be to help the Abyssinian and, and because people aren't quite sure it's confusing. Um, and originally the, the Freedom Trail today um, was created with the purpose of it going with the Abyssinian Meeting House. But um, one of the, one of the, People that did the research had decided that we weren't moving fast enough, and he gave it to um, other hand, put it into other hands, and that's how it became the Freedom Trail. They should, be, they do belong together, um, but we are two separate entities, two separate nonprofit organizations. Good, thank you. And then, yeah, the second link I posted was your direct link to your organization, mm -hmm. a donation. Okay. Yeah, thank Jackie. You. Uh, is the the Abyssinian Meeting House Church? tagged in any historical way like a national historic monument site or something like that yes and it's funny you should say that because uh, the meeting before this i was with national park service um we are um one of 600 and uh, something sites throughout the country we have um, recognition as part of national park service um we are uh, an official the only well, there are two now. There's us and the Harriet Beecher Stowe House, official underground railroad sites in the state of Maine. And we're part of a much larger organization, which is called the Network to Freedom. So, yes, we are. We are part of a much larger group of people. Any, any, uh, yes, Emily. Hi, thanks so much for your presentation and for educating us on 
on the meeting house. Um, I have two questions. One is uh, how, how, where they went from Portland and how they got to Canada, you know, what regions of the state did they go through? Because it's a long ways and it's cold. And I'm just really curious, like the directions they took. Um, and then the other is uh, just your, your vision for the restored meeting house. Um, mm -hmm. Will it have any functions to, for meetings and organizing and events um, or more education? Yeah, so I, I'll answer the second part because um, it's the freshest in my mind. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, the goal is to um, restore the Abyssinia Meeting House, which we have the funds now to do the downstairs. Um, we just have working with the city of Portland to get the permits that we need to complete the work that needs to be done uh, because there's nobody that really pulled a permit for the type of work that needs to be done. So we're kind of at a standstill. Um, with the city of Portland, uh, because when the build, when the church was bought by um, a group of people and they made it into apartment buildings, when it was the Abyssinian church, it, it wasn't classified. They didn't have to have any sort of classification for permits. Um, and when the house, when they, when it changed into apartments, they then categorized it, and you had to have permits then, and they categorized it as apartments which is ironic because now that we are here today, we are the Abyssinian meeting house and we have to change it back to assembly. So what it was originally meant to be, it no longer was according to their records. Uh, so we're working to get to all of that. We do have an architect. We do have a project manager. We do have a building committee and we are restoring the building. Um, I, I, I wish I, you had a picture that you could see um, we recently put in um, all brand new windows, all brand new doors, the brickwork, the masonry work was all done around the bottom of the building and the paint that used to be there was all stripped. And I got to tell you, I was just there this morning and boy, that building is just gorgeous. Um, we want to return it back to its natural state, museum quality, um, that we will have, um, you know, lectures, we will have meetings. There is some meeting space that will be there. We will have education um, workshops, education exhibits, um, because we have, often we have a lot of school-age children, a lot of college-age children, a lot of adults, tourists that want to get into that building to see exhibits in, in, in that space. So that is our plan um, to, to return it back to what it was. It was a social hub um, for the community. Um, and, and that's what we will do with that. And then the, the other question that you asked was the route that the uh, runaway slaves took. And so, as I said, the goal here, th there's a, a map um, that I saw and I, and I could send it over uh, to, to you. And it's a map of the, the routes that were taken. So oftentimes they came through, they'd come through here by the Abyssinian or on the way out, they would go back by way of Sebago Lake for some reason, and up by um, uh, Augusta, China, Maine, or, or around that way. And then they would just go out into Canada. And then once they got to Canada, some of them stayed, and then some of them went on to England. Uh, we had a question here. Um, it was, are you guys working at all with the Green Memorial AME Zion Church? Um, I go to the Green Memorial Amy Zion Church. <laughs> Reverend Lewis is my pastor. Uh, he just married my son back in August, and my daughter. I'm extensively um, a real active member of Green Memorial Amy Zion Church. Um, we don't do any work um, with them per se. Um, we're not a church anymore. We are a meeting house, and that that has to be um, well known because when you go to get the funding and the grants. It's very different when you say that you're a church or, or an organization, a nonprofit organization that we are today. So we have no church affiliations at all. Excuse me. Any other questions for Pam? In my uh, research, do you work with any genealogical societies? specializing in genealogical histories of descendants of enslaved people? 
No, we don't. That's that's interesting, though. Do you know, are there any living um, uh, descendants of members of the church when it was that still live here in Maine or in Portland? Yes. Yes, there are. We have um, a couple of them are on our board, um, McKenzie's, um, and um, Bob Green here. He's a historian who does work, and his family um, was, uh, I believe, Reuben Ruby was part of his family, or they were descendants of um, that. So yes, there are families here that are still depend dependent. And are part. Um, what's the what's your goal for your fundraising? I mean, how far are you from your your fundraising goal for the restoration? Well, so right now we are uh, waiting for. Um, we have been selected. Uh, there were a lot of people that went through, and we are one of ten people uh, that has a federal. Uh, money from the federal government um, to the tune of 1.75 million that will go an awfully long way in the restoration of the Abyssinian church. And um, we have the funds for downstairs, as I told you, which would be meeting space, bathrooms, a um, couple of exhibits we would keep down there, kitchen and offices. Um, so we're continually um, fundraising uh, in, 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 you know, in the way of, grants um, and gifts from people and sponsorships. So, uh, you know, love to have all of you come on board and, and help anybody who would want to come on board and help us raise money. We are actively seeking money um, and, and really waiting on the governments, uh, that $1.75 million, to see what happens with that. Any other questions? I know there's a there's a, a a significant historical event that had quite an impact on the membership of when it was a church also, um, mm -hmm. that, uh, and that was the the sinking of the SS Portland. Could you talk a yeah. little bit about that? Yeah. So the the reason that that so significant was because it was really the demise of the Abyssinian Church, and the reason it was, as I told you earlier, that. Um, that the black men who were heads of households worked on those ships. And um, there were 18 members of the Abyssinian meeting house that were on a uh, the SS Portland, which was in uh, Massachusetts, I believe. It, um, it was docked there at a really bad snowstorm that they shouldn't have had, they should not have gone out in in this snowstorm and they went out and uh, the, the captain of the ship the captain of the boat said we're going and i don't care and and really there's some hearsay about the reason that he chose to do that is he was a little older than than another uh person that he worked with and that it was ego that told him to go ahead and, and go out in this storm and it was a very bad and they they, they call it the titanic of of uh, New England, and he went out into the ship, and unfortunately, they didn't make it very far out. The ship sank, the boat sank, the SS Portland, it's called, sank, uh, and on that were those members of the Abyssinian church. Um, as I told you, they were heads of households, and so the women who lost those incomes could no longer support the Abyssinian meeting house. Um, and or the Abyssinian church then. Um, and so it, it just kept dwindling and dwindling and it finally had to close its doors because of lack of money. But that, uh, so, so they often call that um, the 18th casualty from the sinking of the SS Portland because the, it, the Abyssinian meeting house went down as well. Any final questions for Pam? Oh, you know, I had one here. You mentioned uh, school kids come and visit yep. and they learn about the history. Do you have a, uh, a regular coordinated relationship with the school districts or schools that they, you mentioned how this has not been part of our history mm -hmm. uh, and it needs to be. Is it is it becoming more a part of our history? Are you working more in a more concerted way with, or are they, is the school district working with you in a more concerted way to make sure this is part of the history the kids learn? 
Yeah, so so I'm also also on um, the advisory committee for um, the the new uh, law that Rachel Talbot Ross, who is my cousin as well, um, that that she has uh, that she that they're waiting to um, incorporate into the Portland Public Schools curriculum. So um, yes, and I've always had a relationship um, with several of the public schools. Um, they call, they want me to come in, they like to talk. We you know, we we can we we reach out. We do community work. I, you know, I have curriculum available for children. Um, but absolutely, it's becoming more and more as as um, the landscape of our classrooms the uh, changes, um, the diversity, the colors of of our classrooms look different than they used to. This becomes more important. Um, the history because it, it makes others, it, it, it includes all of us, so that we're not just telling a one-sided story about the history of Portland. Um, so absolutely, yes, there is an, a very much uptick and in increase in people wanting to get this information, people wanting to hear it, to learn about it, to teach about it, and understand the importance of it. Um, so absolutely. Um, you know, feel free to contact me. Um, our Facebook page is loaded. Um, Abyssinian Meeting House Facebook page is loaded with um, main black history as well as other black history. Um, I encourage you to go and look there and can always contact me via that. Um, if you're interested in me, I could come and talk to you, come and speak to you, your classrooms or figure out something that we could do to work together, collaborate here. And thank you for this. Um, but I had a question, it's kind of a personal one, maybe not too personal, but what <laughs> led, how did you get here personally? Like, what was it that said, you know what, this is where I wanna stake my, um, put my stake in right here? Mm -hmm. um, so the restoration and in, in, in coming into the restoration, um, it's very, very much a part of me now um, because, as I mentioned earlier, my sister is the founder of the Committee to Restore the Abyssinian Meeting House. Her name is Deborah Cummings Kadrawi. She formed the committee. She started the nonprofit. She did all the legwork. Um, um, it had been around in my family for probably 10 years, and I wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, I started, uh, I told you, I was forced into being, uh, you know, part of the board. I came on board to make my mother happy, really. And, um, and boy, then I started to do the Facebook page and I just fell in love with the history, black history. And, 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 it, and it happened to coincide at about the same time, my children, I was helping them do their homework. Um, and I was doing a lot of biology and science and history together, which I, I just had a newfound love, passion for this work. And I just, I, I really, I, I, I love, I love what I get to do with this. And, and it is a passion of mine, sharing this information, digging for more information. It's a personal challenge. You know, when I get to come and do a talk like this, I do a little more digging and I find a little more each time I dig. It's, it's, it's crazy, but I do. I find, I found things, you know, this time that were different from the last conversation that I had, or the one I had yesterday was different from the one that I had last week. So it's just, it's a passion. I love it. And it's a good work that we're, that's being done when I get to see those children's faces and I see how much the children of color impacted by having, it's a source of pride for them. When I see how much they're impacted by this, when I get to come into their classrooms or they come to our building and I see them light up like, like a Christmas tree um, when, when we, they're allowed to talk about this piece of history that belongs to their ancestors. And I think that's a really good note for us to end on. So thank okay. you so much, Pam, for joining us. As I said, I posted here in the, in the chat, the link to the Abyssinian um, uh, website uh, where you can go to make a donation to help support their ongoing um, restoration efforts, uh, as mm -hmm. well as thank you for your invitation, Pam, to um, come out here to campus for anyone yeah, who I would love to. to in the class. 
speak yeah. to our students. I certainly think that would be also a worth worthwhile uh, undertaking. And thank yeah. you everyone for joining us today as well. I appreciate you. Um,